Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you tuning in. Oh, my gosh, guys. Welcome to another show. Like, we just keep making them more and they just keep coming. Uh, we just keep putting in the Google machine great authors and like they just show up like every day. There's sometimes there's two a day actually, and uh, they show up every day. So make sure you subscribe to the Chris Voss show if you haven't already. Uh, refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives, dogs, cats. Get everybody listening to the show. Just play it when you leave for work so the cockroaches have something to listen to. Maybe they'll be smarter and move out. There you go. Uh, go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. Uh, follow us over there. See what we're reading or viewing. Go also to all of our groups Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, if you put in the Chris Voss show anywhere, you're going to find so many different groups and accounts and everything. We just dominate social media. We try to as much as we can. Uh, also, go see the video version of this on YouTube.com for just Chris Voss. And you can uh, hit the bell notification there, follow everything we're doing. We're also on LinkedIn Live. So if you're following us over there, go see the live version on LinkedIn. It's uh, pretty cool. And plus, you don't get that... Uh, annoying music that we have at the beginning which is actually kind of fun anyway today we have a most amazing author and i think he's going to blow your mind he's going to lighten you he's going to make you so smart uh, it might improve the quality of your skin and maybe your sex life i don't know uh my lawyers say i can't say that's a definite but what do you know listen to the show you might just have amazing things happen to you so anyway enough with my bs and everything that i do to pitch a show let's get into our uh, author that we'll be talking about today who he is what he does he's put out this new book that uh, we'll be talking about today and the book is called fair pay how to get a raise close the wage gap and build stronger businesses. His name is David Buckmaster. And uh, we'll be talking to him today about his book. This just uh, June 29th, 2021 came out. And he's got an amazing history with him. He is an expert on pay who has led corporate compensation teams at Nike, Starbucks, and Yum! With an exclamation mark. That's a brand, actually. Uh, people are like, why is he saying Yum? Is he hungry? I am on a diet, so that could be true, too, as well. Uh, brands have worked with him, and uh, business leaders uh, work with him on pay projects all over the world. Uh, Mr. Buckmaster, uh, ironically named for uh, a guy who's into pay, it was named uh, to the global shortlist of the 2018 Financial Times and McKinsey and Company Bracken Bauer Prize for Emerging business writers. Fair Pay is his first book. He's originally from Tampa, Florida. We won't hold that against him. I'm just kidding. We love our Tampa, Florida people. Buckmaster now lives in Portland, Oregon. Stereo, uh, what is it? Stereotype with his wife? Oregon stereotype with his wife. Uh, he's going to have to explain that now. Daughter and a Labradoodle. For more information, you can visit his book uh, link. Uh, what is it? David Buckmasterbooks.com. Welcome to the show, David. How are you? Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. I, I will say, I think I'll have to leave, put the uh, skin tips and sex tips in the uh, updated version of the book. So we might there not be able to get to those today, but thanks there for having go. me. Well, I just, I just feel like being smarter and collecting knowledge and curating great information and data like uh, what you put in your book just, just makes you better. So there's that. What, what is an, what is a now lives as a Portland, Oregon stereotype yeah, with his wife? <laughs> What is that? You know, it's just, so <laughs> yeah, I, so uh, you already made fun of Tampa. So let's just jump into that, right? So you you know, I grew up being like the Florida man, you know, where all the yeah. crazy stuff happens, and yeah. you get used to get made, making fun of people that are from Florida, and that's okay. Moved to the other corner of the country. I'm in Portland, and now there's all the like Portland, uh, Portland stereotypes. Portland, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's a it's a joke, you know, just to say, <laughs> yeah, we've got like a uh an obnoxious coffee machine downstairs and we've got a labradoodle and you know we're in all the uh kind of normal portland -esque things that you would expect so you know it's just trying to lighten it up a little bit after the uh whole mckinsey breckenbauer stuff right so it's uh there you go yeah there you go you've gone from so w would it be fair to say you've gone from one extreme to another i don't know i, I watched that portlandia show that makes fun of portland and it's it's quite funny it is yeah and i think the I think what I've heard from plenty of people in Portland is that it's actually kind of tough to watch because it's more <laughs> more of a documentary than uh, uh, than a spoof. It's like uh, you know, there, I remember there's just this one scene where you know four cars show up at a four way stop at the same time, and like the joke because it's uh, you know uh, Fred Armisen, like it just goes on 
for like 10 times longer than anybody's comfortable with. And but like, that's so true. That happens all the time, you know, because everybody's so kind of passive here. And that's, uh, I mean, they just nailed the show. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a great place to live though. You know, the joke is Portland is where young people go to retire. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, uh, you know, pretty apt for sure. Well, there you go. Well, there you go. At least you're not in that crazy Florida. There's a, that, that place is always interesting. If Florida is, I always say Florida is the Florida of America. Or no, Florida is the Florida of Florida. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unique for sure. I don't know if you've ever seen that Bugs Bunny cartoon where he's like sawing off the state and it just floats into the Atlantic Ocean. It's like, yeah, you know, I kind of get it. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So I'm totally used to it. Like I'm the Florida man on my team. And, you know, people are always super curious about alligators. And so, you know, we can talk about alligator facts if you want to, because that's just a part of uh, part of life in Florida. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm used to getting made fun of. So feel free to lean into it. Although you did make fun of Tampa. And I will say, you know, my lightning just won the Stanley Cup back to back. The Bucks are go. Super Bowl champions, and the Rays are doing pretty well. So we're in the, you know it's kind of the end of the world when Tampa is winning championships left and right, I guess. That well, that's that that could be a sign then. I think that's in the Bible, oh, isn't that? Yeah, I or think I think the Aztec said that, right? The, yeah, the sub four horsemen, I believe, Florida is absolutely four. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get to your book and talk about book. Uh the book. Uh give us I, I kind of shouted out your plug from the bio. Uh, but give us whatever plugs you want to do. Tell people to, uh, where to find you on the interwebs and buy your book. Sure. Uh, well, so the place where I'm keeping everything is just my website, davidbuckmasterbooks.com. Um, I have all the or most of the socials, not all of them, but uh, I'm most active on Instagram. So you can follow me at d.buckmaster on Instagram, LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to me on that. Uh, the book is available, like you said, Chris, um, right now. Uh, I think there are a little bit of supply chain issues out there. I, I some of the indies, but... Um, everywhere else that you like to buy your books, it's available now. So thank you in advance for checking it out. There you go, guys. Order it up. So uh, give us, uh, why did you write the book? What made you go? And this is your first book. So what made you go, turn it, I'm writing a book. <laughs> so ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm a practitioner. I, I work in something called uh, Total Rewards or Compensation. We're like a, 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 like a really hidden away team of most big companies, HR staff. And people don't really know we exist, but our job is to try and figure out how much money should we pay people, right? So uh, it's one of those things where everyone you would think would want to be nice to you, but they're always, you know, kind of upset, right? And so I'm kind of, I guess, mid-ish career. And there's a part of me that just knows that I can't, we can't be doing this the exact same way for the next 20 years, because I think the, um, or at least for the rest of my career, I guess I'm only thinking about this maybe selfishly, uh, but uh, it's one of those things that the way that we think about this stuff now clearly is not resonating with, uh, you know, employees pay is such a personal topic and everybody's got really, really strong opinions about it because it's their livelihood, right? Like it's how you go on vacations, afford your kids school and dental bills and all of that fun stuff. You know, there's this stat uh, at Payscale, there's this compensation research firm that says, you know, about one in five people believe they're paid fairly, you know? Um, and like if our, as you know, HR or whatever it is, if we are, if our customers are essentially our employees, like we wouldn't, you wouldn't tolerate four out of five people thinking that your product is swindling them or hoodwinking them somehow, you know? So there's something that we do that it's not resonating. And we see this in kind of the broad macro sense too, right? Like uh, wages have been stagnant for a long time. Uh, executive pay is, uh, you know, really, really high. Um, I, I saw uh, a past episode that you posted this morning uh, mm -hmm. about maximum pay, right? And I had to listen to it right away before we, we talked about this. So, I mean, it's clearly like, uh, like I'm trying to approach this from the industry side to say, what's going on? How do we think? How do we get out of this black box of pay and start helping people understand what goes into this so we can make the, um, the entire ecosystem a lot better? So the book uh did not set out to write a book initially it was one of those things where i wrote an essay for that contest uh it went well and then things started to fall in place from there but you know i, I grew up my mom was a librarian you know both my parents are big readers books all over the house it's just always been natural i love writing uh, this isn't the first thing i've written uh but i just uh, you know it, it really just a dream come true to have this opportunity so this is pretty interesting, and you've worked with inside these companies to try and mm -hmm. uh, tackle this sort of issue. Um, you know, it, I, when I grew up in in uh, high school, I started reading the tea leaves, and at that time, uh, when I was leaving high school, I graduated in what nineteen eighty six, 
and it was the rise of the age of the Ivan Bioskis. Uh, I was a Donald Trump fan at that time, certainly not now. I, I, I watched the arc of his career and his bankruptcies and his failures. Uh, I even had his recession book that he pulled back that was honest about, you know, how bad it was and how he almost bankrupted himself. Um, the Ivan Bioskis, the David, uh, the Milkins, uh, you know, all that sort of rise where suddenly there was a sea change in what I've been taught. Uh, you know, as a child was, you know, you go to work for a big company, you work there for 40 years, you get a gold watch, you get a retirement, you know, you have the two car garage, the, that whole Levitt style sort of uh, nuclear model age model that everyone was trying to somehow get back in the box after Reagan. And, uh, and I think the recession of what Nixon uh, and, and, you know, a lot of disruptions that were starting to really take place in, in the world and economy, especially as we globalized and um and i could see you know there's a lot of stuff going on where they're like the the middle class is going to fall apart and that's when you saw this this uh increase in uh, and and it was really sudden i remember it at the time watching suddenly this thing where wall street's like hey man if you want the share price to go up you just lay off bunches of people and you saw this whole greed economy that came out of wall street with the ivan bioski area of you know acquiring businesses trashing them and throwing out employees and and all this stuff where there was this rise of executive pay where you know it just amplified and then over the last 40 years we've had uh we've had wages stay stagnant and uh, there's no you know little little to no minimum wage increase and we've seen the dissolving of the middle class and now everyone uh, just seems to always be at their wits end, struggling. Most people don't have savings. They can't survive maybe a month without pay. Um, and, you know, you have people that if you fall ill, you can fall into bankruptcy. I mean, it's, it's really turning into quite a, quite a mess. In fact, it's reaching those points that you see with fa that, that, that bring in fascist governments or communist governments or different other governments where people are just fighting for, for uh, scraps. It seems, uh, you know, I've watched the whole dissolving us being manufacturing to a service economy, but there, there's not a lot. I, I anyway, I'm going to quit orotating here and let you talk because no one wants to hear yeah. me. But I watched a lot of this, so talk to us about uh, different aspects of the book and and that plays in. Tell me if I'm wrong or right or or uh, or whatever you think. No, I, I think you're right. You know, my my personal history is. Uh, you know, I was born in the Reagan era, so I've really only seen this version of the world. Um, uh, what, what I'll say is um, you know, COVID really highlighted a lot of the issues that you brought up, right? It's amazing how quickly we went from, hey, these workers are essential to, hey, these workers are freeloaders and they need to get back to work, right? Uh, yeah. So like we, we have this like very interesting ethical conversation, depending on where you are in the pay scale. If you're low in the pay scale, it's all about well, do they deserve it? Are they worth it? You know, do they have any skills whatsoever? Like we start, these are questions of humanity. We also layer on, on the economic front, we layer on questions of, well, what about inflation? You know, if we give them any sort of pay increase. Now on the other end of the scale, it's completely the opposite of that, right? It's like, well, uh, now it's talking about, you know, performance and, uh, you know, this is just the natural way of competition for things. We have to invest, you know, at the, at the top end of the scale. Like there's no, there's really no strings around this, right? There's no limits, there's nothing. So I think your point is, uh, is spot on in the sense that uh, like we just have fundamentally different ways of thinking about, you know, kind of the the high low version of this. And what I've tried to do in the book is to try and in the first half, it's just it's called pay as it could be or pay as it is. And uh, what I'm trying to do there is just unlock the black box of how pay works at most companies. I think people will be surprised to understand that it really works very, very similarly at almost every big company in the world. We look at the same survey sources. We kind of have the same mentality. We do the same certifications. Like, like I could theoretically drop into any company in the world right now and be kind of up and running in you know, a week or two. And that's not because of any great skill that I bring, but just because of how consistent our industry is. And we're hidden away, so we don't really get challenged on that stuff. And while I'm talking about companies, let me also just kind of give my little plug to say, I'm here uh, not as a spokesperson of any company that I work on, but th these are just my, these are my thoughts around pay, right? I feel like I have to kind of give that disclaimer while, <laughs> while we're here. The second half of the book is talking about pay as it could be, you know? So, you know, I was talking earlier around the kinds of questions we're getting asked now around how do we close the gender wage gap? How do we make sure people are paid a living wage? Um, those kinds of things. How do we get more transparent and open up this black box? The way that my industry functions right now is not equipped to meet those challenges, but we're going to have to do it very, very quickly. So that's the primary reason. I want people to be able to push those conversations from the bottom up 
um, in their companies to understand what we're doing. But I also want my industry to change in a pretty dramatic way. And I want uh, I need executives to make sure that you keep this on the agenda. Fair pay has to stay on the agenda. Otherwise, it uh, we, like we will continue to create uh, just push the problems that we have now until what I worry, you know, is there a point of no return where we just don't get this back? And people will say, let's just throw the entire system out the window, which I think would be quite harmful. Which would be, I mean, we'd have to go to like a communism uh, flat pay status yeah. or something, wouldn't it? Was that the model we'd end up with? Well, I, I mean, I mean, I, I would hope not personally, you know, uh, it is, I, I think like, I don't, think I was just wondering they, if that's the yeah, model that you would refer that we would end up at in, in a worst case scenario. Well, I don't know, maybe, what, I don't know what it would or be. It could, or it could be something like, you know, what you see in Brazil or South Africa where things are so extreme that you, it creates oh, so uh, a total rest, collapse of the economy right? and, yeah. and just one, one thing collapses to another and it just, it just becomes a free fall. Sure. It's just a spiral of, uh, not, not good things, right? But I think, uh, you know, you're starting to see some of the language now around uh, around capitalism in general and say, like, well, let's, you know, let's uh, let's abolish it or let's change it fundamentally. And like, there are very, there are like the edges mm -hmm. for sure have to get sanded off this thing. Uh, but what I, what I think people mean by that is not so much that they don't like going, you know, to their local main street, their local farmer's market. Like those are, those are market-based enterprises, right? I mean, I live in Portland, it's deep, deep blue, but we love our local markets. We love our local vendors, you know, like that, these market-based economies are great, you know, and they solve a lot of mm -hmm. problems. They're not, they're probably not the ideal system for everything. Uh, but like, I think we do need to preserve that. But what I think people, when they say, let's, you know, abolish it, let's throw it out the window. I think what they mean is they get upset when they feel like they've lost this sense of autonomy over their own lives. And that's true regardless, depending on where the concentration of power is. So to your point, if it's, you know, you've lost all sense of power, everything is state run, owns the means of production, communism, you have no autonomy of your life uh, or your economic condition in that regard. In the same respect, if all the power shifted to corporations, a lot of those same outputs happen too, right? There's only, you know, uh, you have no say over your employment conditions, your wages, you don't even know how they're set. Uh, you know, you've got limited mobility, like, the, the social class you're born into, there's not much opportunity for you to, to uh, escape out of that. So I think when people get really upset, it's because of one of you know this extreme where they just feel like they've lost control. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is help people retake control over their pay, over their career. There you go. Now, you mentioned and touched on uh, gender issues of, of uh, yeah. uh, 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 pay and equity and, and racial in the book. I was just going through the the, bot, the thing on the book. Um, you know, there's a lot of arguments. Is there really a gender pay gap? Is there really a racial pay gap? I think probably you have, as an expert, probably have more insight to this. And, and uh, so help clarify that for us, if you would, in your opinion. Yeah, so the um, the core of this is the definitions, right? Because I think if you're on the left, you know, uh, I, I'm going to make some generalities here, right? If you're on the left, you tend to focus on something called the wage gap to say, well, women make 71 cents on the hour uh, or 71 cents on the dollar as opposed to men. You know, black workers make 64 cents as opposed to white workers wage gap. There's the other part of it, which is pay equity, which is what most companies focus on. And these are distinct definitions, but I think um, we tend to, find our own camp on this and uh, like really uh, like we're mixing it up. And I think that's the core of a lot of our debate because sometimes you'll hear, well, is there really a wage gap? Is there not? And the answer is yes. Uh, but we're talking about two different definitions. So when we say pay equity, what that means and what most companies are trying to get after is let's figure out, okay, what are the differences once we control for where, where you're based in the a company, the job level you're in, uh, your experience, your, uh, you know, whatever sort of factors that a company would, um, uh, express as being acceptable for pay differences, performance, that kind of thing. That usually is a smaller gap. Pay, the the uh, pay gap, so there's pay equity and then there's the pay gap. The pay gap is talking about what are the broader systemic implications of, let's just take kind of the, the average pay for women versus average pay for men. And so it doesn't control for any of those things. Now, when you hear somebody say, well, the real pay gap is X, like that's a tell that they really don't understand the issue because mm -hmm. they're just mixing two definitions at the same time. So you can have um, you can have a zero pay equity gap in your company, meaning that when you control for all the, the whole list of factors, there's no gap, right? And you can have a pay gap in your company. So what that means is if you are like, let's say the entire senior leadership team is white men, right? Mm -hmm. um, Naturally, like your pay, your your raw pay gap, those just the arithmetic numbers 
th you're going to show an actual gap there between uh, because the men are in different positions than the women for the most part in this example. Now, if you were to separate that out on the pay equity side, you might be okay there. So like, it's, um, uh, I, I go through this in, in like great depth in the book just to explain what these calculations mean. But just, I think the takeaway is there are two definitions. And if you hear somebody say that the real pay gap is X, like they honestly, they don't know what they're talking about. So it's, it's a real thing. Uh, we just have to get very crisp about what we're trying to solve. So this has always interested me because I've been trying to get to the bottom of this argument and find where yeah. the truth is. I don't know what the truth is. I, I, mm -hmm. I want, I want everyone to have equity. I want everyone to, to, I want everyone to get paid the same, you know, there's the, so, so what you're saying, and it sounds like if people really want to get to the bottom of this, go buy the book, which I will be reading. Um, it, it sounds like, so, so are you, are you telling me that, I mean, my understanding of the pay argument of the gap is there's, there's, uh, there's six white women on a, or there's six women on a board. And there's six guys on a board, let's say, <clears throat> just, we'll just throw, make up some numbers. And, and somehow those six women on the same board at the same level in the same jobs are not being paid the same. Is that accurate or true? Or is it, cause you, you told me earlier that it's not, yeah. but, you know, where we're, we're saying, okay, these guys on the board make this, but maybe someone in middle management makes that. And that's yeah. not the same. And that, that makes no logical sense because those people don't have the same jobs. Right, right. So you're speaking about uh, the, the kind of the two different gaps. So let, let's take your um, your example. Like, let's say they're all on the board. Uh, they mm -hmm. have the same. Uh, well, let, let's say they're all at the EVP level. Like the board pays a bit different, right? Like that. That's, let's just say they're all executive vice president of marketing. For whatever reason, this company's got six EVPs of marketing. No company's going to have that, right? But let, let's just go with it. Uh, they all make X uh, dollars um, a year in total comp. Uh, uh, you know, and then you can split it, you know, our, uh, around racial, gender lines, or whatever. There's going to be no pay equity or pay, uh, gender wage gap in that respect. Now, okay. uh, because they're in the same job, they are uh, making the exact same amount of money. There's no gap whatsoever, right? So that's pay equity. So companies, you know, their companies are clearly more complex, so they won't they won't be able to cut it that uh, finely. That's the pay equity gap. Now, we we can't universally say it is or isn't there, right? Every company is going to have their own set of data around whether that's there or not. So some companies, a lot of companies have gotten very good at saying we pay for every dollar a woman makes, a man makes a dollar. Like that stuff's pretty rigorous. You know, there's like usually farmed out of third parties. Uh, they validate it. And that's the pay equity side. That's what companies are typically trying to solve. The pay gap side is more around less like comp is kind of the last step in the chain there. If we say, okay, like, in the UK, for example, this might help illustrate it. In the UK, we have to report on raw page gap, pay gap data. So that means you just sum all the pay for women for sum all the pay for men, figure out the averages and see if there's a gap there. So what that highlights is um, it can talk about your pay policies, but can also talk more about who's sitting in what chair. So um, the, the solutions for a pay gap, when you've got all of your women in middle management, all of your men in uh, senior management, that's raw pay gap stuff you have to report. That's going to show a difference, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. logically, it would. I mean, that just Absolutely. makes sense. Right, right. And, and, and that's why companies are trying to get after it. But the, yeah. uh, trying to figure out, okay, so how do we get better representation within the leadership ranks for a company to try and solve that? Now, the, the much harder I mean, question, which, which, go ahead, yeah. If I can interrupt you there, and my apologies, yeah. I don't want to throw you off. Uh, but, 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 I mean, why do we need to solve that? I mean, if you're at a higher level in a mm -hmm. business or a different level, your responsibilities are different. You're, you've, you, you're higher. You should be getting paid more. If I'm on, if I'm a yeah. CEO of a company, I should be getting paid more than someone in middle management, regardless of their sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so why an, is that a pay gap then? So it's an insightful question in the sense that uh, compensation teams at most large companies are not necessarily trying to solve that. They're not trying to solve this, but the uh, because what they're saying is our pay policies are set for, like you're saying, the hierarchy of pay increases the higher up you go to the organization. So to solve the pay equity gap, they know how to do it. They've got policies, they've got okay. pay ranges. That's what, not all companies are there. In fact, I would guess most of them aren't because they're not running super rigorous programs. That's an issue that some companies have gotten very good at solving, and it can be solved internally within their own uh, company. When you have to report on the bigger wage gap around the entire pool, whether in society or whether in your entire company, those are really signals about uh, economic mobility among different groups, right? So if we're saying, like, if we look at the Fortune 500 right now, uh, you know, I think 
I, I'm going to probably bust the number, but about, I think about 40 of the CEOs are women. Uh, four of them are uh, uh, black and all four of them are uh, black men. I think uh, uh, only, only, only recently, like very recently, like the one, the first black woman or one of the first black women was appointed to the CEO chair of a Fortune 500 company. So I think when we talk about pay gap, like that raw systemic stuff, that's starting to ask questions around, well, why, why, why do all companies look the same? You know, why is a, you know, a white guy at the very top of the organization? And then taking that a few clicks down and saying, well, wait, how come like only 5% of our director level people are, all, you know, are women or are black or whatever. And that's to say like that asks much harder questions, much further upstream. So what I like to say is like your compensation team is kind of last in, in that line to figure out once you get people in the right chairs, then how do you pay them? But what we can't solve is the stuff way upstream. So, uh, we are less like we are less the canary in the coal mine on the compensation team saying that you've got like trouble coming up. We're like the black lung disease that you get years after working in the coal mine. Right. Mm -hmm. So like the like the raw pay gap is just a, it's just a function of who are you promoting? Who are you hiring? You know, are you creating ceilings, you know, for, uh, you know, like gender or racial lines? And then mm -hmm. how do you solve that for around your recruitment policies and promotion policies and all that stuff? And then pay is a natural you know, having good pay policies is a natural output at the end of that process. So, uh, sorry. So this is why, uh, you know, we have a lot of confusion because my industry has not done a great job explaining what we're trying to get after on this. And it's, it's quite complex. And, uh, you know, I do hope people will read the chapter because I, I think I articulated a little bit more cleanly in the chapter than I'm doing right here. I'm going to be reading this book because I really want to solve, I really want to understand this problem. And I, and I, and I'll be the first to admit, I don't know what the answer is. I, I hear all sides and I hear so much data, but professionally, like you are experts in this. Uh, so let me ask you this in, if I have a marketing team, okay, of mm -hmm. six people, three are guys, three are women. And uh, they're like, Hey, Chris, the, there's a pay gap in your thing. Now, let's say two or three of the guys have worked for me for, say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. A couple of the other uh, women that are on the team, maybe they joined in most recent years, maybe, and, and stuff like that. And I've got, an, I've got a follow-up that will throw even more devil's uh, advocate into this. Uh, but, but does that get uh, shown as a pay gap, even though it really isn't? Because, I mean, these people have been with me for 20 years. They've yeah. work their way through the system it's likely they'll be, be being paid more than somebody who just got to that level within the last few years is that is that also a thing that fudge <laughs> so, so, so you're, 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 you're hitting the complexities of this stuff right so in your exact <laughs> example in your exact example like if there are only six I, like I'll, I'll spare people the statistical stuff around this but there's not technically enough people to run a statistically valid pay equity analysis on this uh -huh. right you probably need 30 40 people to say okay have we controlled for all the variables to make sure that this particular variable of gender is popping um but let's say it wasn't three and three let's say it's 30 and 30 and you still have that problem and we feel like we have the validity that we can say uh, that there's a pay equity gap there now one of the variables that you would say is an acceptable factor for pay differences is the experience that you've just said. So if the, the men happen to be more experienced and to your point have progressed further up in the pay range, you would, you would say this is acceptable. We have not, we have no pay equity gap according to our own standards. Now, one of the challenges is there are no legal standards here. Uh, so technically it's illegal to pay somebody in the U S uh, you know, different space on gender, but there's this massive, loophole carve out for performance related pay right and so if you say well it's based on merit uh then mm -hmm. you basically kind of drive a truck through um any potential uh you know definitional ways of doing this i hope that changes in the future but when you have smaller teams or uh then in your example yeah, you would have a pay gap but you might look at it and say actually we don't think we need to solve it because these differences for our internal processes are explainable if the if the women are, are new on the team and uh they come and they're upset about their pay and then as a manager you know most companies would feel confident saying well listen uh you know uh this set of three uh men on the team it's not because of gender it's because they've got uh 10 more years of experience or whatever it is and they've gone up through our, our system in the same way now this is where things get super messy right it's hard to like have these pay conversations that are extremely complex but in your example uh uh yeah, you would officially have a, a raw pay gap, but you might choose to not do anything about it because you can explain it. Mm -hmm. So let, let's play a few other variables and tell me if they are variables or if I'm just smoking crack. 
Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've hired thousands and trained thousands of employees across my career, whether I was with the Cincinnati bell or my own companies. Uh, and, and I've seen these transitions. Uh, one transition I've seen is, is women leaving to go have children and then mm -hmm. wanting to come back into the workforce. Um, and I, I, I want to address that is, is that a factor too? Because if I'm paying somebody who's been on my workforce 20 years, who's a man and a woman who's maybe taken time off, do we need to balance that out to where even though you take time off, that's not a thing, but, but it still is really. I mean, if you, if you take time off and come back, you, you are, you are getting behind in the system. Do we need to, yeah. do we need to bump that or is that fair? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, these are very complex questions, and as, maybe we look at uh, you know very egalitarian societies like some of the Nordic countries, right? Where you know your 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 paternity mm -hmm. maternity leave could be a year plus. You know there are very strict rules around pay. Uh, you know, and the overall spectrum from low to high is actually quite small, um, and, and differentials. Like even with all of the stuff that you know they're probably twenty years ahead of where the U.S. is on some of this legal stuff, but like they still have pay gaps, right? Where the U.S. is raw pay gap. Remember, just the kind of the additive side of it is eighteen percent or so. In place like Norway, it might be seven percent. So it's mm. still there. And so to some extent, you know, of course, you know, if women are still are seen as the primary uh, caregivers in society, then yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and if they step away for it's one thing if they step away for if a woman steps away for a year, you know, your policies might look different than if somebody fully resigns, leaves the uh, uh, um, the workforce for whatever five, ten years, and then comes back when their kids approaching middle school. Like, yeah, you they they would like the men in that situation if they were primary caregiver would would not have kept up with their uh, with the men who stayed either. So really, it's just a function of uh, the choices we make in society around who primary caregivers are, and then. But I, I do say. Uh, there are plenty of um, opportunities for companies to clean up their policies in this regard. So yes. some companies have, like, let's say you're in a sales role, a, 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 you know, a big sales role, and uh, a client relationship might take you whatever three years to really develop to see fruit on. You know, if, the, if a, a woman has really designed and built that relationship and cultivated it, steps away maternity leave, but then is dinged on her bonus when she comes back because there's a duration mismatch there where the actual relationship to bear fruit was three years. She was gone for 18 months, but she did all the work up front. But then you've dinged her for the payout because she wasn't technically physically at the job. Like those kinds of things, like you can try and design your programs around to make sure people aren't penalized uh, around some of their programs to make sure that if you go on maternity leave, paternity leave, like you can come back and make sure that you're not like you're going to basically pick up where you left off. So I think uh, there may be some like I, I think what you're hitting at is, you know, are there situations where, you know, um, you know, that primary caregiver uh, will, uh, you know, continue to get paid or, uh, you know, essentially like a, a bridge payment. Like it, those are things companies may want to consider. Right. Most definitely. <clears throat> and <clears throat> let me play devil's advocate again. One of the problems I had as an employer was my top paid people were salespeople. They were commissioned mm -hmm. people and we would pay them a draw when they would start. So we would help people, you know, it's like you pay their bills for the first couple months until they could build up their pipeline. And we had a great system where we were guaranteed to get our money back. Mm -hmm. And, but one of the problems I had in the state of Utah was I couldn't get women to take those sales positions. I, hmm. we, I, I would drive me mental because we, you know, we wanted a balanced workforce. We wanted an equality uh, workforce in our telemarketing divisions and our processing divisions and our, in our delivery divisions and other companies that we owned interest in. We had a balance, especially in processing, like processing that, that was always, you actually we had more women than we had men in processing. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think women maybe are better at that articulation and that, attention to detail because of their ability mm -hmm. to uh, multitask and everything else but part of part of the reason for that was the security element of it women women would always ask me you know when they would interview for the sales position uh what's the you know what's the health benefits what's the insurance right, sure. and what's the security and women are are definitely more security driven than they are like males who will take high risk um, and, and more performance sort of stuff. You know, they're the guys who will work late at night. They'll go the extra miles, uh, uh at least, at least from what I found. And, you know, sure. women, women are more concerned about being at home, taking care of the children. They want to be home on time. I mean, routinely 
the women would leave my office at five o'clock, punch out and be gone. And, and the guys would be, you know, I think a, a good example is, uh, what was it? Uh, what was the movie? <clears throat> you know, you see Al Pacino working in a bar late at night, you know, selling the crap yeah. out of anybody and yeah. everybody, uh, Glenn, Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross. You know, those were yeah. my sales guys, the Glenn Glary Glenn yeah. Ross guys. Yeah. And so, um, and so technically my guys that were the sales guys. Now, when I moved out of Utah, it changed a lot. Uh, right. When I moved to yeah. Vegas, I was able to hire a lot more saleswomen that were commissioned. There were a lot more women, but usually they were largely single women who, who didn't have a family at home and were willing to play that risk ball because they, they could give it that sort of time and element. But I imagine that mucks with a pay gap as well because my guys would be making 20 yeah. or 30 grand a month. And, you know, my processors are getting paid. I think it was like 2,500 a month. They, they didn't get paid a month. But, you know, they had security. They would always get paid whether they did the job yeah or not. yeah yeah i mean I, w what i might say is to, to those to those gentlemen who are married and have families go home please uh go cook for your family <laughs> go like well, go like contribute you know because like yeah. you're like putting all that emotional and professional labor on your spouse is uh probably not great so i, I can think of this yeah. story so uber uh a number of years ago right went through you know they, they lost travis kalanick uh for lots of reasons one of the things that came in uh result i think eric holder went in you know, former attorney general of the U.S. under the Obama administration went into this whole review because it was just like, you know, super public falling out with Travis Kalanick. And, you know, Uber was one of these companies in Silicon Valley that like, we're going to keep you here. We're going to make you so comfortable you never leave, right? We're going to run dinner service at 9 p.m. Uh, and uh, so you never leave. And, you know, you can't, you can't have a family <laughs> that way, right? But like one of, one of the solutions, which was like ridiculous to me was, okay, I know what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that our recommendation is you're going to move dinner from nine to seven like i'm sorry if you have young kids at home like seven is still not going to cut it you know so yeah. like there may be um i'm i'm mm. largely convinced that you know the, the the people who like this hustle culture people are working 80 hours a week I, i'm pretty convinced that it's not as productive as they think it is you know so i, I think uh, some of the most productive countries in the world are also countries that um have really uh, kind of egalitarian and thoughtful policies around people's time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, flexibility, uh, I think sometimes is used, I actually talk about this in the book, where flexibility is used as what I call the total rewards trap. Uh, total rewards being your entire combination of, you know, work-life balance, pay, benefits, uh, you know, all of that kinds of stuff, career development. Uh, so everything the company offers you in exchange for your work. But sometimes y you get this kind of thing for when it comes to women or people you know uh or you know even same-sex couples with, with young um uh young kids at home it's like well we're gonna pay you for your time we're gonna pay you in flexibility now that doesn't mean they're any less productive but i think i think it will challenge companies to say okay can you get done in four hours if somebody else gets done in seven or eight and then go home and be with your family like i, I think we will all be better off in that regard uh you know utah is an interesting state you know again <laughs> utah is probably not going to be the same uh uh as as Vegas, right? You know, those are pretty, those are pretty mm -hmm. extreme examples, but I, I think it, to some extent, like leaders just have to model uh, behaviors to say, you know, you, you need to, you'll, you'll do your best work when you're a whole person inside and outside of work and, and when you're taking care of your responsibilities. So I would say, man, if that's you, uh, please go home, go home yeah. every single hour and contribute. Well, here's the yeah. other aspect of that, that I left out. A lot of these, a lot of guys will go for high risk, high reward, but normally in the single space. So there were a lot yeah. of times where I'd have guys that would come to me and they'd be like, Chris, you know, I'm making like 20 grand a month, but you know, I just got married. I just got in a relationship. She wants security. We want to have kids or she, uh, they have kids. And uh, I need to quit my job so I can go to work for a bigger corporation that has like really great maternity package and sure. this high end stuff. And I'd be like, you're making 20 grand a month off me. You can buy that insurance, but yeah, you know, you, you can buy the insurance that you need, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not paying you. You know, you want this super cut of commission, but you, but now you're telling me you want this thing. And they would usually quit and leave for corporate jobs where they would get paid. I don't know, like, 50,000 a year. Um, but they would take the pay yeah. cut for the security. So there's kind of a balance there where, where people go for that in the high end commission. So I would lose them usually when they would get married or have kids, they would, they would exit out of that sort of system. But I can imagine that fucks up the pay gap when we look at these, you know, the broad numbers, like you said, and we compile. Yeah. Them. Um, yeah now high end sales jobs are, are I, I would guess a pretty small percentage of the overall economy. Okay. Right. You know? um, so like, uh, but even then, you know, I, I think, you know, 
a company who runs those policies has an obligation. You know, if, if most of their staff or a good chunk of their staff are, you know, are uh, direct sales and they're being paid on commission, you know, the, the calculations for your pay equity gap, uh, you know, like, they're probably they're going to look very different than a traditional company, but like they would still want to understand, you know, what's driving it. Is it truly performance or is it, you know, we have a habit of setting our uh, client calls, um, you know, at 8 p.m. dinners, which, you know, again, if the women are, are the only ones responsible for taking care of the kids, like, you, you know, like uh, this is a hard balance of is that truly necessary to run your business that way? Or there are other things we can do where we can get the best of both worlds to make sure that, you know, um, people are feeling that they're treated fairly, that they're paid, uh, that everybody has the same opportunity. Uh, but, you know, uh, sales is sales, sales comp actually is its own sub function. Like there are separate uh, certifications and things in my field just for sales comp because it gets these questions get so complex. Yeah, and I would imagine even though with you know what you said about the small percentage, I was imagine with big companies, there's there's not only salary, but there's performance pay or bonus pay. Um, you know, guys are typically networkers and builders, and and we team up. This is one of the reasons we rise through corporations is we club up, and mm -hmm. we don't we don't claw each other down to keep each other from getting ahead. We 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 club up and move up. Um, the other thing the question I have for you about the pay gap is. Um, and this is something, you know, that's part of the argument. So maybe you can give it some clarification. Women don't normally get into uh, heavy labor fields, uh, mm -hmm. largely. So, and those are usually much higher pay fields. If you're working in a smelter, if you're welding, if you're, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of women in the welding field. Uh, there's women in the welding field, but, but I mean, these, these hard labor, high paid jobs, um, does that muck up the numbers as well? I would actually challenge the um, the argument that they're actually paid more. I think that was probably true decades ago. I don't think mm. that's true anymore. There's this crazy story this past week where I think uh, uh, Biden, you know, it was executive order to increase um, federal firefighters to $15 an hour minimum wage. And people freaked out. It's like, these are firefighters, like federal firefighters. They were making less than a Chipotle shift worker. You know, like what is what is going on here? And, you know, and so like, you know, I look at this data a lot. You know, I've worked for companies that do manufacturing, that do distribution centers, like the hard labor stuff. Um, honestly, like what we're seeing is a lot of these industries are converging. So the idea that, you know, you've got the smelter and the, you know, the Detroit uh, auto plant or whatever, like, like, you know, I, I wish this weren't the case, but like those jobs don't, largely exists in the U.S. as much anymore, right? So um, I would say uh, some of those things were probably more prevalent back then. But what I'll also say is like, the what our jobs pay are a, a product of our choices. Uh, so in the sense that, uh, you know, most of the jobs that are, uh, or a lot of the jobs that our economy is going to create over the next 20, 10 or 20 years are very human focused jobs. They're home healthcare workers or service workers of, of all types, uh, maybe less in the manufacturing space. So, uh, but what they get paid, like I'm convinced that having looked at this data, you know, all day, every day, is that the most important force of driving pay is not intention, but inertia. Like these jobs get paid this because we've said they do a bunch of years ago, right? So an example that I can use is, you know, um, in the 1930s, when the US first launched uh, uh, minimum wage, Fair Labor Standards Act, like kind of the, this, here are the rules basically for labor law in the US. What they did not include are, were huge sectors of the economy that were populated by women and minorities. So things like restaurant workers, hotel staff, agriculture, all of that just were not included in this. Um, in 1967 with the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, 64, 67, I don't have to look that up. Um, the, um, one of the things they did was to try and close and say, now everybody's eligible uh, for these laws. Uh, what they, what they uh, researchers have found since then, uh, something like 20% of that raw wage gap was closed by just including them in the law, right? So this makes my point around, well, it's like, we think that there's just grand supply and demand based free market for pay, but oftentimes it's some, you know, we've made a choice around what these jobs should get paid and then a nurse is trying to take care of it. So mm. I talk a lot about this in the book to say, well, we think there's a free market, it's at best free-ish for pay, you know? And I think it's because only one side is the information around pay, right? Like you can't necessarily control the price of your labor because you don't know what, you know, all the different shops around the country are paying. What we're seeing now, especially for low wage work, is a lot of convergence around industries. So if you're uh, kind of in that entry band of employment and, you know, you have a choice between working at 
you know, Chipotle, Home Depot, you can drive Uber, you can go to an Amazon distribution center, like that, those things are all kind of converging to each other now. And so I think, uh, whereas pay used to be very segmented across that. Uh, so I think those kinds of increased competition is going to be good for workers across all, um, you know, across, you know, however you want to categorize them, right? I, I think that the competition stuff is super healthy. So we're, we're striving for, 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 for perfection. Has any country or any business uh, nailed this thing where they've gotten perfection on pay gap and equity and they've gotten this thing down? Has anybody gotten there yet? No. Uh, the answer is no. And, you know, uh, pay, well, perfection is not something we're ever going to achieve. You know, people are, when you, when you throw people in the mix, things are going to get messy. And, you know, one of the things that's like, uh, uh, you know, true about my industry as a whole is like nobody's ever happy, regardless of the number you pay them. You know, people get used to that number very quickly. Um, so it's like, w it's just kind of built into what we do that people are kind of like, how are you managing pay is just like, who's the most angry right now? And what do I need to go try and fix? You know, like, it's very whack-a-mole. Um, what I will say is like, like, so there's this software company called Buffer. And it's like every comp person's go to now, this might even help explain some of the payments. We've had you on the show. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. one of, one of their, um, you know, the, what they're really known for is, is how they pay and it's all formula based and it's incredibly transparent. Like you can look up now what everybody is paid at Buffer. Yeah, um, and so, but, but the way they do that is like when you do that, when you make the more transparent you get kind of the less discretion you get, uh, like that's kind of the natural way of things in pay because like, uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's, you, you want to try and, uh, you know, kind of normalize and formula, formalize some of this stuff. So uh, when pay is entirely transparent and it's formula based, you will have, by definition, a 0% pay equity uh, difference, right? Because the only thing that matters is how you show up in the formula based on factors of your experience and the job you're in and all of that stuff. Even in that scenario, you can have a pay gap. Uh, I don't know this about Buffer, right? But like if they're entire you know, senior leadership team are white guys, like they're going to show a pay gap. Because again, these are the two definitions, right? So the answer is, there's really no perfection on this. It's just about managing it. And what I talk a lot about in the book is pay really, it has to just be a mindset, you know, like, are we constantly evaluating how our people are showing up in our payroll systems, um, you know, on our Excel worksheets, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, and this is something that just has to be constantly monitored and maintained because people just do not trust the process right now. Oh, wow, this is hilarious. <clears throat> we had Leo Widrich, uh, the co-founder of Buffer, on the show, the podcast. He's actually podcast episode number 12. Okay. I think this is almost podcast number 800. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Looks like we that, spoke yeah. to him in, in 2012. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure I had that name right because I was shouting it out from memory. But uh, I watched Leo and been friends with him on Facebook, and I watched him evolve. And I remember when they dropped a, we were, I was actually one, in his influencer program when they first launched Buffer for several years, where we got like the free accounts and, and, uh, you know, gave him a plug and shout out every now and then. But I watched him announce that, uh, that pay transparency system that they did. And I was like, okay, buddy, that's, uh, that sounds like a load of fun. Uh, but yeah. good for you. Um, so yeah. let me ask you this. Do we need to legislate? Uh, do we need, do we need to legislate a $15 an hour minimum wage federally? Do we need to just put that in a place or is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I, I think $15 an hour minimum wage is a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. and so uh, whether we need to legislate it, I would hope like, I would hope we build the kind of economy and ecosystem and leadership capacity where you don't need to. Right. So mm -hmm. like the, the idea that, um, I would hope that, and a lot of people are saying, David, you're completely naive on this. And trust me, I, I, I live in this data. So I know how naive I am, uh, that, you know, all like every business leader is going to wake up and say, you know what, my people deserve, you know, a living wage or something close to it, or they need to stay on the agenda. Um, I do think there absolutely must be a, a hard lever option at the bottom of the pay market. So whether that's an indexed living wage that's much higher than it is, my home state of Florida just voted for $15 an hour. It'll be there in like the next three to five years somewhere, but it got like 60% of the vote. Like minimum wage is super, super popular nationally. Like I think people don't necessarily appreciate that, but it's a very popular policy. So if it's not minimum wage, it's indexed. Like you could look at something that's like... Um, yeah, what we call sectoral bargaining, for example, like you'd see in Europe or in Australia, places where you don't like it's it's kind of a different way of doing a union where uh, it's not I go argue with my managers of my company. It's the entire industry. So fast food is making the standards for fast food. Gig work is making the standards for all of gig work. 
or, and you know, just kind of go sector by sector. And then that allows you to meet the needs of that entire sector that gives a platform for all companies to compete kind of on the same uh, uh, standards at the same time. But I'm a, I'm a huge proponent. I think you need to have a really hard, uh, like, a, like a meaningful um, lever at the bottom to make sure uh, you know, uh, wages are increasing as companies do. Now, I think there's ways you can design it to say, well, if the, you know, if unemployment takes to this respect, maybe we can do temporary jobs or companies that are very small don't have to participate at the same scale as bigger companies. I think big companies have to drive this stuff. They have to set the standards because they have the means to do it. And trust me, I know the numbers that like, I really know the numbers uh, on a lot of these companies. Uh, they have the means to do it. It's really just about to set the, the priorities they choose to set. You know, and, and, and I'm all for uh, uh, raising the wage gap. To me, a rising tide lifts all boats. And if you study sure. the economy, that, I mean, it, it, if everyone's got more money in, the, in an economy to spend, the economy grows and it lifts. If they don't, then, then or, or if they're just not spending the money they're sitting on, you know, consumer confidence index, et cetera, et cetera, then the economy suffers. Um, but a rising tide usually lifts all boats. Um, there's... One thing that's kind of alarmed me, uh, there's two different things. One is like what you mentioned, where people where people are starting to legislate a minimum wage. But the, the funny thing is they're putting it years off. Like it has mm -hmm. to increment and grow and kick yeah. in, yeah. which is probably good for people on Main Street. Um, the problem is I look at it and I go, actually, five or six years from now, it probably should be $20 an hour, yeah. uh, especially yeah. in the inflationary sort of struggles that we're seeing right now. Um the other thing is, is I've seen like Amazon promoting, oh, everybody needs to pay $15 an hour. We're all for that because they can afford it. The guys on Main Street, the little guys right now, especially that are crawling out of COVID, that just, you know, they're just barely hanging on. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't jump to $15 an hour to compete. And you're seeing that in the small wage market. Uh, especially entrepreneur markets, you know, McDonald's still hasn't quite got there. They could if they wanted to, but then they're, but then, you know, a, a guy who's just running a restaurant, you know, a guy like sure. me, yeah. who just has yeah, yeah, one yeah. restaurant, you know, yep. he, he can't quite get there, especially coming out of COVID and, mm -hmm. and they're having problems. Like I was listening to uh, a discussion last night where there's a guy who has a Mexican restaurant that's hugely popular in Las Vegas. And he, uh, the problem is he was having 45 minute waits where people were upset. They were having to wait. He could he just only serve so many. His problem coming out of COVID is he can't hire enough cooks and enough yeah. workers to show up to do the work. And so he, he actually has to close on Monday and Tuesdays so that he can mm -hmm. make sure that when people show up, they don't have a 45 minute wait. So taco Tuesdays are out. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, at yeah. the Mexican place. It, but this you know, is the problem he's trying to resolve and he can't he can't deal with the whole balance. But Amazon can. Yeah. yeah. So th yeah, I'm I I'm completely empathetic with the point you're making. One of the things that I think none of us really know the answer to is what are we going to look like in 6 months? Because I wonder how much of this is just pure dislocation from from COVID, right? Like if, you know, we got up to something like 14% unemployment, is th there were crazy stats where if you made less than, I don't know, $40,000, you had, you know, above 50% chance of getting laid off. And if you made over 100,000, you had an almost zero chance of getting laid off, right? So there are jobs that are stable in the economy. And then there's the great majority of jobs that are not stable. And what we did chose to do as a country was to just lay everybody off and rehire them again, you know, like in my state of Oregon, you know, through even through the end of the school year, schools are only open two days a week, right? So like, there's all sorts of things going in to say, well, uh, yeah, um, you know, childcare is not up, there's unemployment uh, stimulus, there's uh, people are just generally uh, sick and tired of being treated like garbage at some of these employers. Um, you know, there's obvious safety and uh, sickness concerns. Uh, broadly, uh, so, so I think like, I'm curious how this shakes out in six months from now. And like, I, I hope we, you know, things are kind of back to normal because I'm seeing these signs too, right? Like I, I went to get my haircut yesterday and like one of the locations only had, you know, a couple of people there and they said the same thing. So the problem's real. Absolutely. What I'm, what I'm wondering is how, how permanent it is. And I, I get the sense that it's not, uh, I'm super mm -hmm. empathetic to, uh, the small business on this. I firmly believe that big business does need to lead in this area and we can design policies in such, in such a way that you can provide more relief to the small business um, uh, or say okay if your wages are going to go to you know x day by this you know by this time horizon you're and we do this all the time now a lot of the wages are okay if you're a small company you're on a different schedule you have to get there by this uh, point of view what i think is one of the problems is we have created 
huge sectors of our economy that are frankly addicted to low paid low wage labor. And so there are going to have to be some shifts to our business models, you know, and I think uh, to some extent that low wage, uh, like the price and uh, price of our products and wages can be are um, a bit arbitrary and can kind of be, uh, you know, set uh, like um, we'll, we'll probably just need to be rebalanced a little bit, you know, and I think no doubt we're going to see some price increases. And I think we already have. There's uh, yeah, I we're, keep, yeah, I we're keep at hyperinflation up. almost. We're, well, we're I, but, but really I, but I think it's, well, it's not like Zimbabwe, right? Like, I mean, we, we've, gone from like, we've gone from like 2% inflation to, I don't know, three, four. Like, it's not like, so there was, uh, and again, I think I'm curious where this comes in six months from now. Is it, yeah. how much of it is supply chain issues? How much of it is structural? What I hope is that some of it for wages is structural. And uh, because like, you know, there's, I keep bringing up Chipotle for some reason. Uh, I must be hungry. But um, like, you know, there was this big article, you know, Chipotle is raising the prices of the burritos five by 4%, right? Yeah. So let's say you go from, uh, so, uh, you know, you're, I don't know, 30, 40 cents or whatever on your burrito. Uh, now, if let's say across the board, all prices go up 4%, but your wages have gone from 10 to 15, you know, you've got a 50% increase. Like you, like our lowest sector of the economy, part of the economy is much, much better off in that rebalancing of the economy. Now, I think one of the things that people underappreciate is say, well, if inflation is going up, four percent wages go four percent it's just a wash you're not you're not getting it like you're just resetting the standards i think the reality when you look at most companies payroll is they might have i don't like if you're a big retailer or restaurant or whatever you might have you know 80 percent of your people you know uh in these jobs but they might only be 15 20 percent of your overall wage expense because they make so little in relative value. So if you've increased the wages, if you're forced to legislatively or for market reasons or whatever, if you have to, if you increase their wages, that's not like on a proportion basis, like things are going to come out. Okay. Like, I think this is, this is perennial. Well, we can't increase wages because then all prices increase and it's not, it's not really going to matter. I, I just, I just do not buy that. You know, I've seen, um, you know, I, I, I know how, how companies make these calls and you don't hear those decisions when you need to make, some massive stock grant to an executive who turns out to not be so great, right? Yeah. You only hear those arguments when it's the lowest wage people in the economy, and that's what that's what drives me nuts. We're be, yeah, I mean, largely, I mean, but we're seeing some extraordinary stuff. I mean, if you've tried to rent a car lately, <laughs> I have not. Or travel, no, not. yeah, but I've heard I've heard the stories on the car. Yeah, it's stuff, yeah. it's it's out of control. Or buy a used car because yeah. you know, and I'm having a lot of people write me uh, from you know our review side of the Chris Show company or review a lot of products, and they're starting to have issues where they can't produce because of the chip crisis and you know a lot of the mm-hmm. stuff that wasn't it. I don't know if this is going to resolve itself or if, yeah. if we're just going to keep seeing rampant increases. Yeah. Like you say, that we're already seeing inflation that come up and right. it's like, uh, how does this all catch up? And yeah. then there are pressures that are in our economy at the federal reserve level. We, we floated trillions of dollars off the chart that has an economic inflationary pressure thing anyway you and i could sit and talk about this for 12 hours <laughs> I'm bad, i bet we could yeah absolutely <laughs> and and I, and I value your time and i really appreciate what you've shared is there anything more you want to touch on in the book or respond to what i've said and and uh, before we go out uh, you know i would just say you know i think you're asking all the right questions i think you're asking the questions that um i hope to have resolved in this book you know i, I think this is a uh, when you do pay for a living, you tend to get the same uh, questions over and over again. And I, and I think just fundamentally, we need to have a, uh, a a better, more sophisticated conversation about pay. And that requires uh, people in my chair to talk about it more and to talk about the data we have access to, what we're seeing, uh, what the realities are, do some myth busting um, and help people get more money. And that's really all that I'm trying to do. Um, I do not believe that we have to give up on our overall economic system. I think this is just a product of the choices that we are making. And uh, I, I am optimistic about the future. And I'm actually extraordinarily happy to see this much competition at the, uh, you know, at the employee uh, level, because um, there really hasn't been anything like this in my career before. That was one of the discussions we were having last night, too, is, is this sustainable? It seems like the power is going back to the employee, but whether or not it'll be sustainable or whether or not corporations will be like, well, that'll be nice now, but we'll, we'll get back to you later and, and uh, we'll fix that. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of other discussions, uh, pan-globalist billionaires and, and people like the Betsy DeVos uh, Center for National Policies who have interest to, to enslave the American people and basically create indentured servitude and, and be able to have... Uh, rampant, uncontrolled capitalism 
and the lowest pay they possibly can. I mean, there's there's some of the narratives behind this, uh, you know, finding of the wage pay gap and all this sort of different stuff. Reading your book, I'm really going to be reading this book, so I encourage my people to do it. And and I I. I, I don't believe that we should be arguing for those people that are out there arguing that the system's fine, we shouldn't change it. It's not. There's always a way to improve everything, and there's always a way to move to a better balance okay. in society and everything and give everybody equity, and I'm all for that as well. Uh, give us your plugs so people can find you on the interwebs yep. as we go out. Sure. Uh, so davidbuckmasterbooks.com is where I'm keeping um, you know press, reviews, all of that fun stuff about the book. Um, I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, whatever your chosen social media preference is. Um, and the book is available, hopefully, wherever you like to buy your books. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you for spending time with us on the show, uh, David. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. There you go. And my audience, check it out. Fair pay, how to get a raise, close the wage gap, and build stronger businesses by David Buckmaster. You can get it wherever fine books are sold. But you only have to go to the place where the fine books are sold because I don't know why. It just sounded good to say at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, my eyes, for tuning in. Go to youtube.com for just Chris Foss. Hit that bell notification button. Go to goodreads.com for just Chris Foss. See all of our groups on LinkedIn, Twitter, all the different places, and uh, follow us there as well. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time.